Well, today um, we're going to continue this series. We've been talking about a bountiful life. And we've been talking about from Scripture, uh, using some of the metaphors that Jesus used. In fact, the most common metaphor he used was about growing a crop. And so we, we looked at sowing. We Next week, we're going to look at reaping. What does that mean? We're going to talk to you about what the Bible shows us about reaping a harvest. Um, we, we've talked about plowing and what that means, the, the metaphor of uh, putting your hand to the plow, being involved in the kingdom of God. And uh, you've probably heard the passage where it says, Jesus said, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That word fit, uh, it means that you're not usable. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go to heaven. It just simply means that when you start to plow, you start to work, and you take your eye off the goal, you begin to look back, you're going to get crooked rows, and you're not going to be fit. You're not going to be usable for God's kingdom. Well, anyway, today I want to talk about something very important. Uh, we're going to talk about waiting, waiting. Now, we live in a culture that doesn't want to wait for anything. Do you agree with that? Okay, this fast food culture that we live in, uh, and I think that social media makes it worse. You become more and more and more impatient, okay? Uh, my dad used to say years ago, 150 years ago, uh, if you missed the train when it came through, no big deal. There was another one coming through next month. Nowadays, if we miss the stoplight, we lose our mind, okay? Okay. And the truth is, we are very, very impatient. But anything worth having is worth waiting for. And in fact, if you don't learn to wait, this is a very important part of life, learning to wait, uh, then you're not going to be blessed. You're not going to have the things that God wants you to have. My son, Brandon, uh, he this spring planted uh, some watermelons. Now, I don't know about you, but I love watermelon. Uh, one of my favorite things in the world, good ice cold watermelon. Love it. Absolutely love it. Now, here's what I learned. And of course, I already knew this, but when he planted the watermelon seeds, I did not go out the next day and harvest watermelons. You know why? Because you got to wait. You got to learn to wait. And this is a critical skill that you can learn. Not only is it important for your spiritual growth, not only is it important that you learn to be patient. By the way, one of the fruits of the Spirit uh, is patience, the Bible tells us. And that is something that the Holy Spirit can work in your life. Maybe you're not a patient person by nature. I get that, neither am I. I I'm like the impatient man that prayed for patience. He said, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. We, we don't want to wait for anything, okay? But the truth is, uh, you've got to learn to wait. It's a critical skill. It is critical for your development. It's critical for you spiritually. It is critical, I believe, for your mental health and for other areas of your life. But we tend not to want to wait. Years ago, I had all three of my kids in the car. We have uh, Brittany, Brandon, and Brooke. They're all adults grown up now. Uh, but years ago, I guess Brooke, our youngest, she was about three years old. And so she was sitting in her car seat, and uh, I was driving them, get it, to church, all right? Driving them to church, doing a good thing, being spiritual, okay? We're going to church, and uh, there was a little old lady now, I'm sure she was sweet as she could be. I, I don't know. I didn't meet her, but I'm just assuming she was sweet and nice and kind and very, very slow, all right? In fact, she was driving very, very slow. And I don't know what it is. Some people, they'll turn on their blinker and they never turn. Does that bother you? Okay. I, it, somehow, no, it's like, it's like boring a hole into my skull. I don't know why that bothers me. That's silly, I know. But the woman had her blinker on, and she was not turning, and she was going slow. Now, being a good father, having my children in the car with me, I did not 
I didn't cuss, okay? Good thing for a pastor not to cuss in front of his kids, right? I didn't use abusive language. I didn't say anything mean, not that the woman could have heard me anyway, but I was being very patient. In fact, I was kind of proud of myself, okay? And Brooke, my three-year-old, sitting in her car seat in the back, she leans forward. We come to a light. She leans forward and she goes, move it, fool! And I'm like, oh my goodness. You have been emulating your mother, haven't you, okay? No, she didn't get that from her mom. She got it from me, I guess. But the truth of the matter is, we don't like waiting for anything, okay? But you got to learn to wait. And there's some benefits to waiting. And uh, one of the, like I said, one of the, uh, one of the uh, gifts of, of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, rather, um, is that we have patience and God will work that in your life if you'll let him. So today I want to show you three critical skills for waiting on the Lord. You got to learn to wait. We're going to pick up today in Galatians chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in verse 6 down through verse 10. In fact, this is a complete paragraph. That's going to be relevant to you in a minute. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, but one paragraph which kind of gives you a theme. And so see if you pick this up. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse number 6. Let the one who is taught the word. Now, who is that? That's you. That's people in the church. Let the person listen to the preaching. Let the person who's taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. And who's that? Well, that's the pastor, the preacher, Okay. Uh, I'm going to explain this in a minute. Why would he put this in here? Okay, it seems kind of odd. Then he says something that the rest of it seems to fit. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You reap what you sow. That's what he's saying. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Now, this is Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 5, there's a whole portion of that chapter that talks about the works of the flesh. And then in verse 22, 21, 22, it starts talking about the fruit of the Spirit. It says the works of the flesh are, and he lists out all these things, big bad ones that we would think, and then things that we kind of give ourselves a pass on. He, he talked about the big sins and the little sins. He, he talked about uh, sins of committing adultery and murder and stealing. And we're like, oh yeah, those are bad things. Then he goes on and talks about how that you argue with one another and you begin to have uh, division uh, with one another and you don't get along. We're like, well, that's maybe not quite so bad, is it? But here's what he said. These are works of the flesh. This is what your flesh produces if you sow to the flesh. In other words, he's saying you're going to get a life that is going to be marked by the flesh. It's going to be marked by division. It's going to be marked by hatred. It's going to be marked by uh, impatience. It's going to be marked by stress and strife and all of these things. He said, however... If you sow to the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, once again, fruit is something only God can grow. I can plant, I can water, but I can't grow fruit. Only God does that. So he says, and we'll go on and look at those in just a moment, but he says you've got a choice. You can either sow to the flesh apart from the Spirit of God, or you can sow to the Spirit with the power and the presence of and the Spirit of God in your life. He says, so, for the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh will reap corruption. Now, what does that word mean? It means that it's dying. Dying. You're going to reap death, in other words. Now, what he means by that is something that we need to pay attention to. Now, we all know this is true in our bodies. Your body is being corrupted. Um, this past Friday was my birthday, okay? And uh, people always ask you, how, how was your birthday? How does it feel to be a year older? And to be honest, I feel 
three days older than I was Friday, okay? Not a year. But the fact is, I'm smart enough to know, and so are you, that this old body, it's not getting better. In fact, it's getting worse. You know, when I was a young man, I could skip a whole night's sleep, go to work the next day, not miss a beat. Now, I can barely make it to 9 o'clock sitting on my couch without falling asleep. You, you, as you age, as you get older, guess what's happening? Your flesh is corrupting. It's getting worse. Um, you know, when I was a young man, I had a, a flat stomach and belly button. I loved to take off my shirt. I had a six-pack, okay? Now I don't have a six-pack. It looks like I've got a keg, okay? And, but the fact is we are being corrupted. In other words, we're dying. Our body's not getting any better. And this is what you need to understand, what he's saying here, uh, that when you sow to the flesh, it doesn't ever get better. It only gets worse. When you sow to the flesh, it gets worse. It's being corrupted. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, what do you like? Corruption? Dying? Getting worse, or do you like eternal life? Getting better. Well, I like that one, okay? So he says, you got a choice to make. And then he goes on and he encourages us. He says, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. In due season we'll reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity to let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well, I want to just give you three critical skills from this passage that I think will help you learn to wait, to wait on the Lord. The Bible is full of verses that say, wait on the Lord. We want the answer and we want it now. But the Bible says, learn to wait. And what we learn from Scripture and from life is that God is never late. He's always on time. Now, he may not be on your schedule, okay? But he's on his schedule. And his schedule's better. He knows more than you do. He can see further down the road than you can. He has more power than you do, okay? And so we've got to learn these critical skills. Here's the first one. Do not be deceived. Now, it's easy to get deceived, isn't it? You ever been tricked by something? You ever order something on the internet and you think it's one thing, but when it gets there, it's something different? Kim just recently ordered a jar of honey that had the honeycomb in it. And I love honey. Uh, she loves honey. And I, I like that. It's very natural. It's very good, very delicious. And so she was like, we can use this honey. We can use it to put in coffee or whatever. And it, she ordered a jar of it, and I can't remember how much it was, but it was kind of expensive, okay? Honey is kind of expensive, and it had the honeycomb in it. And when it arrived to our house, lo and behold, we were expecting about a pint or quart jar, and I'm not kidding you, the jar was about that big, and about that big around. I, I've never seen such a small jar of honey in my life. Now, we were a bit deceived. We were a bit tricked. You ever order something? And, I, you know, I get most of my stuff uh, off the Internet so I don't have to go into stores. You know, I, I like that a lot better, okay? I know some people love shopping. I am not a person that likes to shop. I like to hunt, okay? There's a difference, okay? I go to buy stuff. I don't go to shop for stuff. I don't want to look at anything. I've got one thing in mind when I walk into that store. Now, the only exception for me is when I go into the grocery store. If Kim says, you need to get some milk and some eggs, and I go to the store, and when I see milk and eggs, I get milk and eggs, but there are so many wonderful, delicious-looking things in that store that are so tempting to get. And so rather than spending just a few dollars, I walk out, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, it is almost impossible for me to go into the store without spending a lot of money. And, and I don't have a lot of stuff, but, you know, when you see this cheese that, you know, 
it's like $10 for a little bit, but you know what? It's from Brazil. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, it's got to be good. They probably marched it up here on a pack mule all the way from South America, and it's got to be delicious, right? So you buy this stuff, and you're like, oh, you get deceived. You get tricked. But being deceived means to wander off the path. That's what it means. So when God says, don't be deceived, what he's saying is, stay true. Don't wander off the path. It's so easy for us to wander off the path. It's so easy for us to wander off the path of what God wants us to do in our life, isn't it? You get distracted. You get deceived. You get uh, tired. You get discouraged. And we become uh, susceptible to wandering off the path. So God says, don't wander off the path. Be not deceived. He says, God is not mocked. Now, the word mocked, this is an interesting word. Because we think of the word mock. I don't know about you, but when I think of the word mock, I think of somebody that's like, nah, 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 you know, like that. Uh, that's to me, it's mocking, right? But the word actually is an interesting word. It means to turn your nose up at. Don't, when the, God says, don't mock God. He's saying, don't go, hmm. You ever go, hmm, to God? You ever just like, you know that the word of God tells us to do something, and we're like, hmm, I'm not going to do that. Need to be faithful. Hmm, I'm a little busy. Need to be generous. Hmm, I, I want to spend my money on what I want. Need to be kind. Hmm, she stole my parking space. I mean, we, we do this, right? Without even thinking about it. We, uh, we do, and the idea there is the, the idea of contempt. You turn your nose up in contempt. So when he said, be not deceived, God is not mocked. What he is saying is, don't wander off the path of Christian growth. Don't have contempt toward God, but stay true. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Very easy to get deceived. Now, the interesting thing, and I told you this would come in uh, and I would talk about this, but Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 to 10, is a complete paragraph. Okay? So whenever you see a complete paragraph in the Bible, you need to see what the whole paragraph says to really get what it's talking about. Okay? So we read that. Now, the weird thing, and I don't know if you find this weird or not, but it seems weird to me. Uh, the, the first verse and the last verse, the first sentence and the last sentence have to do with finances. It's the weirdest thing. He says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatever you sow, that will you also reap. Now, what we think of when we read that is like, you know, well, don't be mean, don't be unkind, you sow meanness, you sow unkindness, you sow uh, being a, a thief, you're going to reap some bad things. And, and that certainly is true. But the interesting thing is of how the Word of God is written for us to give us three stark, clear warnings about how not to be deceived, how not to turn our nose up in contempt to God, how not to wander off the path of Christian virtue, of Christian living. Okay? I'm going to give them to you. Number one, he gives us a warning concerning generosity. And that's a weird thing. I don't know how you feel about it. It seems rather weird to me that that little sentence has anything to do with what he's talking about here. But when you understand what he says there, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. That verse simply means that it's okay for a church to pay their pastor or their staff. That's all it means. And, and the one who is uh, sharing the word uh, is talking about the pastor, talking about those that lead in the church. Okay, so he's, he's setting that, saying, this is a good thing. And then the last thing that we read, he said, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, some Bible scholars believe that the book of Galatians, it was a letter written by the Apostle Paul, was the first of the Apostle Paul's writings. And among uh, the writings he wrote, he wrote more books of the Bible than anybody. Uh, but this was the first one, they believe. And then 
uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, they say that it's most likely that, that was seven different letters that he wrote to that Corinthian church that were combined into one. But in the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul is telling the church, you guys need to be generous. And what he was telling them to be generous toward was the church in Jerusalem. Now, let me just catch you up on what I'm talking about. Uh, when the church started, where did it start? It started in Jerusalem, okay? And uh, the apostles were there on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people were saved and baptized. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church began to grow like crazy there in Jerusalem, okay? And so what happened was on that first day, 3,000 were saved and baptized. And then later, uh, just a couple chapters later, it talks about that it began to grow by the thousands. It's likely in the first year or two, there were probably around 20,000 people going to that church in Jerusalem. It was growing. It was incredible. It was something. And people were being, I mean, the culture was being changed. Lives were being changed. But what began to happen? They began to be persecuted. And before long, a person that claimed to be a follower of the way, that's what they called it there, uh, the followers of the way, we'd say Christians, the followers of the way began to be persecuted. And so as a result, many of them dispersed. God used that to spread the gospel around the world in a very short period of time. Okay, there's always a purpose. But those that stayed there in Jerusalem, they were persecuted, and, and some of them even had their property taken from them. Some of them lost their jobs, their ability to make a living because of their Christian faith. Okay, So what Paul was doing, he was telling churches all around the, that region of the world, take up a collection to help the poor at Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about here. He says, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And, and all Paul is telling the church is that you've got to be warned about being stingy. You've got to be encouraged to be generous. Now, I don't, once again, I've already said this two times. It seems like an odd thing to put there. But his warning, God's warning for us about not wandering off the path is a very interesting one because he starts out by warning us about generosity. And I'll say this, it is easy as a believer to wander off the path of generosity, is it not? It is easy for us to turn our nose up in contempt. And, and he's talking about, of course, in the church but he's also talking about helping the poor. Now, let's be honest. And I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want to take a poll. Okay? But I wonder, have you ever helped? Please don't raise your hand. Have you ever helped someone that was standing on the street corner begging? Now, you probably have. Okay? You've probably given them some money, a buck, to whatever, uh, some change. Or... I've actually, you know, I've people, seen people with the sign, I, I, want me, I need food or whatever, and I've actually bought meals and so forth, but I found that that is not af actually what a lot of people are after, they're after beer money, okay, so, uh, but if you ever, if you ever helped somebody and then you found out later that the money you gave them, they went and bought beer, and you're like, well, I didn't give you that money to get beer, and then you had your heart affected uh, not to help. Have you ever been scammed? I, I've, I was scammed one time uh, at, um, at a gas station. This man, uh, he, had a, he pulled up in his car. And he was going around telling people that uh, his daughter had broken down about a couple miles from there. He needed about 20 or 30 bucks get some gas, to help her out, et cetera, et cetera. And he even took us over and introduced his daughter to us, who happened to be pregnant, sitting in the front seat of the car. Well, I saw that, and I'm like, well, I'm going to help this person. I gave him like 20 bucks. I found out that he was doing this to other people. Well, we found out that this was a scam, okay? 
Uh, I, for some reason, went there the next day, and the same guy with the same scam and the same fake daughter in his car was doing the same thing. And in all of my uh, spiritual, um, how can I say this? All my spiritual maturity, I began to yell at people there at that gas station, do not give that guy money. He's scamming you. He took money from me yesterday. And he, it was so funny because the guy goes, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. I can't believe, I said, I can't believe you're uh, thinking that you can pull the same scam at the same place two days in a row. Well, anyway, he ended up coming to our church like a week after, he didn't know I was the pastor of this church, I guess yelling at him didn't make it better. Uh, but he came to our church and he was going around our parking lot. And I came out and I saw him doing this. And I said, dude, I am going to call the cops on you. Somehow or another, he felt led of the Spirit to leave, okay, and leave us alone. Now, I'll tell you that little story because the question is, have you ever gotten jaded? Have you ever said... Well, there's just a bunch of crooks out here. They're scamming people. Have you ever had your heart close because of somebody did something wrong? You know what I learned to have to do a long time ago? When God prompts me to do something, I do it with a spirit of generosity and leave it up to God what they end up doing with it. Otherwise, you might as not well give at all. And my point is this. He warns us concerning generosity. It's easy for our heart to get closed and wander off the path. He also gives us a warning concerning sowing and reaping. He said, uh, you're going to reap what you sow. If you sow to the works of the flesh, you're going to have devastating results. But if you sow to the life of the resurrected Christ, what are you going to get? Well, he listed it out in Galatians 5. Love. Anybody like love? I do. And, And look. He's talking about the agape love of God. This, not just romance, because that's not what he's talking about. But when you sow to the Spirit, you're going to get love. You're going to get the love of God poured out in your life. The love of others. You're going to see it. You're going to experience it. Joy. Anybody could use some joy? Does watching the news, does watching election coverage rob you of joy? It does me. I I want to throw stuff. And I started to say at the TV, but I don't really watch the TV anymore. I watch everything on my computer or my phone. And, uh, you know, but it makes me angry. And I find out there are times that I don't need to look at that at all because I won't have any joy. He talks about patience and peace. You know, you don't know if you have pa- uh, patience until your patience is tested. You don't know if you have peace until you're in the middle of a storm. Anybody can have peace when everything's going your way, right? But when you're in the middle of a storm is when you know if you have peace or not. Anyway, he talks about uh, goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So he gives us this warning about sowing and reaping. That if we sow spiritually, we're going to reap good things. But if we sow to the flesh... If we sow to the sin nature, then we're not going to reap good things. We're going to reap corruption. And then he says, he gives us a warning concerning endurance. Endurance. He said, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I'm so glad that God's word includes those words, due season. Now, I like reaping immediately. But that's not the law of nature, and it's certainly not the law of the Spirit. You reap after you sow. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You want a lot of love in your life? Sow a lot of love. You want a lot of grace in your life? Sow grace to other people. You want kindness in your life? Sow a lot of kindness. You you see how it works? God says that we will reap in due season if we don't give up. I wonder, the way that's written, 
I wonder if there are people that are that close to reaping a harvest and they give up. If they're that close to a breakthrough and they throw in the towel. If they're that close to having their lives completely changed for good and for God's glory, and they stop. They stop just short of the finish line. Well, I hope that you will not do that. He warns us, do not be deceived. Now, I've got two other points, but they're not very long. Okay, I tend to do this. I talk a lot about the first point, and then the last two points are not that long. He, he talks about next, you got to defeat distraction. Don't be distracted. He said, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And his point is this. Don't get distracted and wander off the path. I, I, Bonnie's out here. Bonnie and Neil, you know, you may not know this, uh, but they've set a goal for themselves, and they're going to run a half marathon in every state in America. Uh, you know, I would think it would be easier to say I'm going to eat apple pie in every state in America, but they're running a half marathon, okay? And, and they're very, very disciplined in this. But I, I, I see that, and I think at one time... I used to run, and uh, I was running this marathon, the Albany Marathon, in fact, one time. And I got off the path. Uh, they had these people out there that were supposed to tell you where to turn, okay? And I guess the person that was supposed to be at this turn, you had to turn through this neighborhood, and it's important not to miss the turn, otherwise you're going to run about 10 extra miles. And if you're running 26.2 miles, you don't want to run any extra, okay? Okay. And I guess this guy had to go to the bathroom or something, and he, uh, he left his post. And I was running, and we were getting close, close to the end, and I was supposed to turn, but I ran past the turnoff point. And I kept going, and I kept going. I was like, man, what in the world is happening here? Uh, and finally, the guy came back, and he saw me, and he went running down the road after me, and it wasn't very hard to catch me because... I'd already run like 20 miles. I was very tired, very slow. And he's like, hey, mister, you missed the turn. You went off the path. And it's easy as a Christian to be distracted, isn't it? We allow things to distract us all the time. But what God is saying is this. Don't be deceived and don't be distracted. And then finally, he says, you got to deal with discouragement. Now, unfortunately, we all get discouraged. But the way you deal with it will determine how you live. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us lay aside every weight. What is it that weighs you down? You got to lay it aside. Sometimes it's discouragement. That'll be what weighs us down. That'll be what causes us to quit. That'll be what causes us to give up. But you got to lay it aside. How do you deal with discouragement? He said, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. You know what God's saying to us? Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't throw in the towel. Stay in the race. Cross the finish line. Why? Because God has a prize. God has a reward. You can finish the race that God has for you. And so deal with the discouragement. Romans 12, 12, let your hope make you glad. Be patient in the time of trouble and never stop praying. Our hope is in Jesus. So when you get distracted, when you get discouraged, you know what the Bible says? Put your hope on Jesus. He's going to help you. He's going to be there for you. He will never give up. And so you got to learn to trust him. And then I read this from the message paraphrase, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I love the way this is, is uh, written. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness 
Everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. And that will be my prayer for you, is that you deal with discouragement by letting Christ be at the center of your life. Heavenly Father, help us today as we, as we trust you, as we follow you. Help us to give ourselves completely to you. Lord, don't let us be deceived. God, let us deal with distractions and let us avoid discouragement. And by doing so, Lord, let us finish the race that you've called us to. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we take our offering, let me remind you that today, if you would like to have prayer before you leave, we'll have someone over here at the prayer station. You can uh, pray with someone. Uh, it can be about anything. You don't have to be a member of the church. Uh, and it can be about anything. It can be your job, your health, your kids. It doesn't matter what it is. You come and pray, and there'll be someone here to pray with you, okay? If you'd like to receive Christ today, I hope you'll come by and pray with them. If you'd like to join the church today, uh, put that on your card and drop it in the offering basket, and uh, we'll get you the brochure and the information that you need. If you'd like to take your next step, if you'd like to get baptized, okay, we're going to baptize soon. We've got some people ready to be baptized. If you would like to be baptized, put it on the next step card. Let us know about that, okay? Ushers, come and we'll give in our offering at this time. Drop your next step card. If you have a prayer request, uh, if you want to sign up for something, drop it in at this time, and, and we'll go ahead and let them pass that. And while they're passing that, let me just encourage you now. Invite somebody to come with you next week. One service, 1030, okay? And um, it's just going to be really good. And you, some of you will get to see people you haven't seen in a while, uh, because over two services, you sometimes don't get to see some people. And there are some people that you probably thought quit, but they haven't. They just come to a different service than you do, okay? You'll get to see them. And so I'm very excited for you and for us uh, about that, okay? All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I love you. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.